Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for inviting me here today to share and reflect on my work in this culture seminar series lecture, Liminal Meanderings Between Art, Science, and Engineering. What do I mean by liminal meanderings? While liminal refers to a transitional or initial stage of a process or occupying a position at or on both sides of a boundary or threshold, meandering refers to following a winding course. For today's lecture, we will focus on these two questions. What is the role of an artist in genomic and neurobiological research? How can an artist influence a project when brought into the transitional or initial stage? We will look at two collaborator projects, Unfolding the Genome, as part of the Broad Artist in Residence Program from 2009 to 2011 at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and Cultured Interactions, Evolving Landscape, a collaboration project with the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research from 2016 to 2018 at the Broad Institute. The videos that you saw earlier was actually from the Broad Institute. It was made during my Broad Artist in Residence program and was used as an introduction to introduce people who visited the Broad Institute to learn about what genomics can do for them and what the scientific research was all about at Broad. My work lies at the intersection of art and science. I'm especially interested in patterning, the microcosm and the macrocosm, evolution and transformation. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? I see Paul Gauguin's existential question from his famous painting as both biological and sociological. I map my movements and memories to answer them. What are our shared dreams and visions? What are our patterns and peculiarities? We have reached a stage in research where we can determine and define what it means to be human. What choices do we make to understand and determine them? My first project is a collaboration project with Erez Lieberman Aden from 2009 to 2011. As artist in residence at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, I worked intensively with him on the project related to genome folding and 3D genome architecture. Erez Lieberman Aden had just successfully published a paper with Van Berkham in 2009, in which they had deciphered a way for determining the 3D genome architecture. He explained to me his hypothesis of the fractal globule model for the 3D genome structure. In a very first meeting, Eris talked about ramen noodles. He explained that on a million-fold scale, the gene is the width of ramen noodles, and as long as a car. He explained that the 46 chromosomes, two sets of roughly 20,000 genes, laid down would stretch from Chicago to Kansas City. Eris also introduced me to the concept of space filling curves, especially focusing on the Hilbert curve on the left and the piano curve on the right. The Hilbert curve from 1891 and the piano curve from 1890 to explain his hypothesized model for the genome globule. Aiden and his team had created three mod 3D models using software programs to show how the 1D line becomes the 2D Hilbert curve and the piano curves. He also showed how the line could fold fractally in two and three dimensions to fit more of the line or of itself into the same space. Below is the idealized 2D piano curve that he shared with me, reiterating the fractal pattern, plotted with fixed intervals so more of the line can fit into the same area. To understand the Hilbert and piano curves, we started doing drawings together while discussing the contents of his paper. He talked about 3C and high C, chromatin loops and domains, and their efforts to understand how the human genome, the DNA found in every cell of a body, folds in 3D. In one of our very early meetings, I handed Eris some electrical wire. Can you make me a model of the Hilbert or piano curve? He was very surprised. Over the next few weeks, we played with wire, trying to fold them to create physical models for the ideal 3D Hilbert and piano curves. While Eris was always focused on folding the wire, I was always focused on unfolding it. 
Over months, the wire forms continued to intrigue me. I knew there was something important about them that I was missing. Through my artworks, I desired to explore the concept of unfolding as life unfolds, as the genome continuously moves and unfolds to interact and give instructions, and as scientific discovery unfolds at the Broad Institute. Over the next few months, I started printing wooden blocks burned with my soldering iron from the drawings created during our discussions. I printed multiples to see, myself, to see for myself what I would learn and figure out by combining them in different ways. While the grouping on the left uses only rectilinear representation to create a continuous piano curve, you can see from the top to the bottom the S-shaped piano curve being formed while using Hilbert forms within it. The grouping on the right shows a curved loop using the rectilinear and curvilinear forms to represent the genomic line. You can see that I'm loosening the rules and parameters of the ideal curves that he had set up for me. This is me printing at the cancer lab, the Golub lab, where I had my own bench so that I could work alongside researchers. My aha moment came while on holiday in the summer of 2010, when I visited the Thousand Pillar Hall with Shivalinga sculptures in a temple in South India from 600 CE. The pillars looked very similar from a distance. But when one comes up close, one notices the differences, the nuances, and the different combinations of patterning. Although each of the Shiva Linga sculptures, the sculptures that you see between the pillars over here, have different sizes and proportions, they represent the same and are recognizable as the same, the still form of the formless. I'm aware that the dancing Shiva on the right you have once a statue in the Ackland Museum for a show are currently running, performing the cosmic dance in human form. And the Shivalinga sculptures on the left approach the same truth. Could the abstract invisible genomic line existing in the software program that Erez and his team are working on not have the same relationship with the physical wire sculpture models that we are trying to create? If so, I could imagine and see an abstract invisible genomic line in a continuous dance, a line with its own intelligence and memory, continually moving through the cell while folding and unfolding sections to interact and give instructions to operate the machinery of the cell, and knowing when and where and how to fold and unfold. They would still obey the rules for a tangle-free genome model. I desired to focus on one 3D curve with seven length segments, once in the studio, I quickly manipulated the wire to sketch drawings on 120 post-its of stills of the dancing genomic line as it unfolds. When I shared them with Eres, his eyes lit up and he immediately borrowed the image. I called the exhibit version 120 of Infinite Possibilities. For my drawings, I used visual cues from The Simpsons to resonate with American audiences. 120 post-its opened up an entire world of possibilities for seeing, visual thinking, reasoning, linking, and understanding how the genome folds and unfolds. Processes that Eres, the Aiden Lab, other researchers, and I had not considered before. Soon, Eres came back with this. Eres redrew by choosing random intervals to plot the piano curve on the right. In place of the fixed intervals on the left, You've seen the earlier diagram as well. For the traditional piano curve to see what would happen, this small change makes it more closely resemble a physical trajectory. Although it's a visual manifestation of the very same mathematical object as in the figure on the left. He included the construction details for this in his 2010 dissertation. According to Eres, the creative process in Guppy's serial visual experimentations led me and my team to explore mathematical variants on the curves we use to help model the genome, variants that we may not have otherwise emphasized. For instance, figure A on the left is a traditional representation of the piano curve. Now, a careful observer will note that the curve is made of segments with fixed intervals. This sort of construction is mathematically natural and easy to implement on a computer, but it's hard to do with electrical wire. Real materials like electrical wire 
but also like DNA, resists the sort of perfect homogeneity. Our work immediately raised the question, could we construct curves that reflect the heterogeneity of real objects while retaining the di dimension-defying mathematical equivalence to Piano's curve? And could not such a curve be a superior model of the folded genome as compared to what we had used before? Figure B is part of a series of a mathematical response in the affirmative. If we could understand this with just one seven length segment, I wondered what we would learn with 20 foot coils of armature wire. Over the next six months, I folded 20 coils for Eris and his team to create a wire sculpture that they could experiment with. For the residency show, I created a site specific wire sculpture under the broad lobby stairs made of 18 coils for passers by to manipulate. To quote Eris, Gupi's massive extraordinary wire sculptures, and more so the experience of watching her explore the problem of genome folding using the medium of electrical wire was eye-opening for me. In these explorations, the world of invisible theories crashes into the world of a sensory experience. It made it possible to develop and deploy new, new sorts of sensory intuition, both visual and tactile, to a problem where our intuitions had typically come up short. These physical explorations with Guppy's artwork went hand in hand with the mathematical and physical explorations of a genome folding theories. A curve that might be first traced out in 3D space could, for example, be translated into an idealized mathematical trajectory. And from there, it might be examined using a new tool set. Conversely, a mathematical effort to examine the consequences of knotting in the genome could directly benefit from realizing the mathematical knot as a physical object which one would push, pull, stretch, and deform. I also created large 60 inch by 60 inch paintings with different levels of layering. Though they were beautiful paintings, they did not add to our information. It was more about communication. Over the two years, we had reached a very comfortable place with a collaborative creative process where I drew my artworks while discussing the project with Erez. Drawing while discussing became a way of seeing together. Based on my experiments with the wire sculpture and my imagined scenarios, in place of asking what is this and where is this going, I created mixed media drawings with what ifs, maybes, and why nots to explain the loops, twists, and warps that I saw. I used collage samples of prints I had created earlier and extended them as drawings on paper. I also decided to experiment and create a looping animation video for Brood from the stills I had drawn, the video you saw earlier. I collaborated with Lars Eriksson and the Brood communications team. We combined soundtracks over six months of wind and percussion instruments that followed the map migratory routes of the genographic projects. We're combining two different projects here. And used the lines drawn with Erez Labum and Aiden on the problem of genome folding to narrate an abstract story of human DNA, migration, evolution, research, and understanding. The video is made available by the Broad Institute on YouTube. Towards the end of my residency, I continued my experiment of extending drawings from collage woodblock samples to reflect on what Erez and I had achieved on this project. I realized that I had moved from Erez's abstract space filling curves to the, to the concrete electrical wire to my abstract 120 post-its, to the physical wire sculpture made with armature wire, to the abstract mixed media drawings and the abstract video. What we had really been doing on a journey together was to see and follow the invisible, so we may make the invisible visible. We shared a work through an exhibit and presentation unfolding 2011 to 2012. Eris borrowed a coil from the sculpture and the digital images to continue his work, own work in his own lab, the Aiden Lab, at the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas, and as director for the Center for Genome Architecture. My residency was complete and over in 2011. A few years later, there were major developments of the project from the Aiden Lab. From 2014 to 17, Aiden Lab members published papers related to this project. I saw my mixed media drawings appear as part of the Aiden Lab media kit for these papers. 
and in articles about the first 3D genome surgery. And as interpretations of DNA superloops, a hypothesis from Aiden and the Aiden lab, and references to 3D genome engineering. Earlier this year, Eris shared these papers with me and explained what had happened. Eris talked about chromatin looping. Aiden and the Aiden lab think that the looping is a way to place certain genes close to one another. In the double X chromosome, they had unexpectedly encountered in the bare body the inactive X chromosome, multiple super loops of chromatin. They found the presence of a DNA sequence, DXZ4, that anchored these super loops. By deleting the DXZ4, the super loops collapsed. So they could effectively engineer or interfere to not just perform linear surgery now using CRISPR, they could effectively perform surgery to alter or affect the 3D structure of the genome. The 3D structure, that would determine from its position if a gene could function, be expressed, and activated. They think that the chromatin looping goes beyond space filling and compacting to help determine which genes get expressed and activated in different cells, thereby influencing the function the cells perform. The Aiden lab hypothesized about the ring-shaped structure cohesin sliding in opposite directions from the, for the formation and growth of these loops under a specific condition. When the cohesin encounters a CTCF bound to a motif that points into the loop, the subunit stops in its tracks. If both rings meet inward pointing CTC of proteins, they will both stop, anchoring the loop in place. They also showed how the laws of cohesion could result in the elimination of domains. I did not know all these when I created these artworks. These for me are the what's, why's, and how's of the project. My art is about possibilities. Recently, I co-authored a peer-reviewed paper with the Aiden Lab and Eres Leibim in Aiden for the A2RU, Alliance for the Arts and Research Universities, Groundworks Journal, and Platform for the Compendium, which shows our unfolding the genome project as an exemplar for arts-inclusive research projects. We reflected on how my artistic toolset and artworks advance our understanding of both the 3D genome structure and of how the genome folds and unfolds. This is how Aiden and the Aiden Lab see my artworks. Art as manifestation of the possible. There is much about the folding of genomes that remains mysterious, about which we can only speculate. For instance, several years ago, our lab encountered what we called superloops in the genome, which arise when stretches of DNA that are extraordinarily far apart along the contour of the chromosome encounter one another in 3D space. This is a phenomenon which we did not predict, which is hard to explain given our best theories and whose underlying mechanism remains unknown even today. I suspect that Guppy's mixed media drawings have long engaged with this interface, and we use them routinely as a way of visually evoking this unsettled state of affairs at the frontiers of our discipline. Here, the discrete geometrical definiteness of the wire recedes somewhat, making space for something more indefinite, what happens when a simplistic models encounter the vast, unimaginable reality that lies just beyond a theory's grasp? One of the most suggestive elements of the mixed media drawings is the way in which they provide a representation that integrates diverse modes of thought. In each image, one can observe coherent structures bubble up as if from a structural welter. Here an idealized mathematical curl, there the same curl, but stretched compressed, bent, warped. The ideal object as it manifests with real materials. Unlike a scientific diagram, the images are not didactic. They present possibilities without enforcing a single rigid interpretation. In this respect, they are more true to understanding than any diagram that is currently possible. The objects that scientists study exist independently in the physical world but the content of scientific theories is abstract. In order to reason about these theories and explore their implications, scientists must develop ways of representing theory. Thus the problem of representation in science is not merely a problem of illustration, but an essential component of scientific reasoning. I have learned that drawing is a way of seeing and reasoning together. It is a language 
even when we do not have the vocabulary to voice our own questions. Looking back now on this project, I can see our experience for what it is. I entered at a transitional stage when a successful paper was published. It became a STEAM project with back and forth conversations between science, technology, engineering, art, and math, between my studio, Eras, and the Aiden Lab, an unenvisioned meandering journey through space, from temples to studios and labs and art history, and time from the 1800s to the current day to 600 CE temples, to have my artworks and creative process acknowledged as an important tool set in the lab to advance our understanding of the 3D genome structure and how the genome folds and unfolds. In my experience, questions raised searching for answers on one project often leads to another project. The questions raised for my second project came while sharing my work on the unfolding exhibit project. For my second project today, we will focus on a completely different type of project. My 2016 to 18 collaboration with the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad Institute, Cultured Interactions, Evolving Landscape, to design the 10 year anniversary. It is about visual communication. How do we see, share, and process information? Our research on this project also led us to extend the project beyond the 10 year anniversary to include two installations at Lab Central and the Montserrat College of Art that resulted in a permanent and commissioned installation. More interestingly, it led me to another interrelated series, Cultured Interactions Continuum. We'll briefly dip into it today from 2011 to 18 that focuses on information processing and synthesis at Broad. During my residency, I'd worked intensively on three projects with scientists and researchers other than Eris Lieberman Aden. Don Thompson, who studied yeast to study and understand the process of evolution because it's a simpler organism. Sarah Calvo, who worked with com complex one disorder and mitochondria and Catherine Luce from Stanley Center, who was researching bipolar disorder. I'd also been introduced to many other Brodies who shared their own projects. I'd also included artworks with information from these projects in my residency exhibit. Or discussions about the unfolding show, Todd Golub, the head of the Broad Artist in Residence program, talked to me about the complexity of information, the importance of the necessity for sharing this information from different projects without spotlighting one over another, about how we can see, process, and synthesize visual information from different projects together. I faced the same problem that he faced and Broad faced, bringing all the information together to create a personal narrative for my own exhibit. I talked to him about my 30 inches by 30 inches painting series, 40 samples that use four basic colors for the CG80 sequence, the genome sequencing that happens 24 seven at the Broad daily, and the three different linear types from different projects at Broad, tangle free lines, branching lines, and closed loops. I'd use different reds, blues, yellows, and greens to experiment with showing how the position in the genomic sequence could affect how it expressed so how it was different, even if perceived, was between G and A, it would be different between A and T. When he saw my experiments with display formats to create a visual narrative, Todd Golub asked me, Gubi, can we only combine in series and or parallel? How do we share this information about the complex genomic landscape and within it? I promise to continue my work on, a, on this post my residency. I remembered my series, Translocations, started as a graduate student at MassArt exploring how my movement and travels in South Africa had affected and changed me. I'd started by creating multiple prints from two small wood blocks that resembled cell structures. I'd collaged them and extended these drawings to create interesting artworks. While this project went on my back burner, I had layered them with information from the other broad projects during my residency. After this residency, I'd also moved on to other projects. In 2015, I went back to work on one of my artworks in this series. I remembered that in early 2009, while working in my studio on it, I'd received a call from my mom, just like all moms do, to check on my health. She quoted a 12th century Tamar Siddhar poem, Nanda Vanattu Orandi, about a man in a garden 
who had not valued his life and physical body and had ended up destroying his health and his life. As I looked up from my artwork to see my garden through my windows, I automatically flipped her words to a garden in a man. I remember Todd's question and description about the complex genomic landscape. Though I had exhibited my artworks and shows, even while continuing to layer this information from Broad, I'd always felt that there was something about them that did not completely work for me. What set it apart? They had become too complex. While they were interesting and compelling to the viewer, how do I, as a lay viewer, draw visual information from them? This would be my new starting point to explore Todd's question. I started cutting up my large paper artworks from the series, 48 inches by 60 inches and larger, into smaller artworks, making each slightly different in size and spreading them out. I continued to layer them from, with information from broad discussions and readings. I explored and studied many more variations by keeping each of these artworks simpler and smaller. So many permutations, so many combinations, and so many possibilities. In 2016, the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research approached me about a collaboration project needing help with sharing varied visual information for an event, the Stanley Tenure Anniversary Project. They had three subdivisions, genetics, interdisciplinary neurobiology and model systems, and therapeutics, including eight groups and various labs researching key psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and autism. The questions with so many different groups within Stanley working on different projects, wanting to highlight their achievements and contributions, how do we represent them all? How do we create a celebration of Stanley and all our efforts on mental disorder? It involved reading a lot of research at Stanley. At 2016, there had been many years since I'd been at Broad and Stanley. To learn what they were doing and talking to them about what they felt were important and common to all at Stanley. What I saw and heard often in almost every conversation, neurons, synapses, movements, interactions, samples, cultures, cell count, sequencing, seeing, patterning, communication, space, time, and evolution. I took my cue from cultures and interactions, two terms that exist in both biology and sociology. Translocations was now officially cultured interactions. I realized that this problem posed by Stanley for the anniversary was a case study for Golub's original larger question of sharing complex information at Broad. Playing with the structures and forms from Stanley, abstracted forms that resemble cellular, human, and landscape forms. I drew my inspiration from Hokusai, the Japanese old man mad about drawing, as he describes himself. Everything I create, a dot, a line, will jump to life as never before. This series is about mark making. For this project, I linked three threads of conversation from Ramoni Kayal, considered by many as neuro. Paul Gauguin with his questions, and Rosalind Franklin with photograph 51 from her lab. It's the lab that's always important, that laid the basis for the double helix hypothesis. I would focus on the evolving physical and man mental landscape to create a narrative that was Stanley, with its origins going back in time to Broad and Whitehead, and further back in time to Kyle and Franklin, and Watson and Crick, and moving forward to explore many varied possibilities that it had set up for its own future. The artworks would explore the process of physical and spiritual change and growth through movement and synthesis, and focus on a complex landscape made of genomic and neural structures that changes and evolves through the four seasons as a visual journey. A core group was formed to work on it with inputs from many more at Stanley through informal and formal surveys at every stage. While well, the Stanley Center core group would focus on the wall of achievements from 2007 to 2017 as text, thanks to our discussions, I would focus on the journey of shared memories with my images that I had started creating in 2006 to 7. It would be a collaboration project on seeing and sharing information involving both art and design. With my new simply layered and smaller variations, I wondered if I should install them as a cell. 
I started my work on layering these building blocks with information pouring in from Stanley Center for a complex landscape across four seasons. In all, by the end of the year, I had 360 collaged and layered hand-drawn artworks. What sets Stanley apart from the rest of Broad is the focus on neurobiology for mental health. Should I install them in interconnected neuronal forms? Should I combine text and image? Should I keep them separate? Should I go sequentially to narrate a landscape through four seasons? How do I layer them for multiple audiences visiting Stanley and Broad? The color coding for each of the different labs and departments meant that we would have to mix them up to remove the hierarchy of information and to avoid spotlighting one over another. I was able to use genomic sequence once more as a parallel layer of information. We had to explore other options as the actual collaged and hand-painted artworks could not be installed in a lab environment. After multiple trips to printers along with the core group, we found new technology that could help us. Digitally printed decals, which could be easily moved around on the wall. This also meant that we could experiment with some of these drawings by manipulating them digitally. Here's a simple with the complex in one installation from 2018 to 19 to show and share with Brodies how we would view the information differently if we showed it sequentially or mixed up together. We would use shapes that resemble neurons. That was the decision. Mix text and images in different sizes around eye level, like electrical pulses moving through a neuron. We would install the decal mural along the narrow main corridor, a journey including the 2007 to 17 Stanley Center timeline. The inability to step back actually makes the viewer conscious and aware of being too close to the artworks, and that makes it difficult to see the whole. But they can see parts of it from the social spaces at each end and from the cubicle spaces facing it. The printed decals used for flexibility of moving, editing, and adding artworks allowed for easy adaptation and change with the evolution of information. I conducted a workshop for them on text panels for the core group, on text size and use of color, hue, saturation, chroma, value, and temperature, all my tools, and different color systems for different media that they could use, red, blue, yellow for painting, red, blue, green for digital, CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and key for printing. Text panels were designed by Boris Osipov from the core group with information being vetted and audited by the core team at Stanley and Broad. I designed to leave gaps and spaces for fluctuating numbers and sizes of text panels and to allow us to chronologically combine three different types of text panels. Finally, we used 16 large panels in three different sizes and three small panels. And a few different types of images, including Stanley photographs, memes, and jokes. By the end, we had 480 plus images, 360 hand-drawn and 120 digitally manipulated images, digitally cropped and transformed. Because that's how the information in projects come up. Some, in, some information is repeated between projects. Over two days with help, we installed them using interconnected forms that resembled neurons. You can see some of them resemble multipolar neurons and bipolar neurons and unipolar neurons. The installation, starting from a social space along the 10 foot high by 70 foot long main corridor, along three long wall panels, and turning around the corner into another social space, was site specific and time specific from 2017 to 2018. We shared our information through gallery talks at the anniversary celebration and at different times through the years for visitors and for the scientists at Stanley and Broad. Over six months, the core group found that the scientists and researchers scan daily and search for selection. They start with one or two key images of interest and have a series and or sequence of 11 to 12 images chosen for the daily revisits in rotation. We devised a guessing game to check those visually skilled seers who regularly monitor visual information for patterns and breaks in patterns, a game we call Spot the Mutation, the decal test prints to be one for the cubicle space. While many picked the slightly different looking lower image on the right, bottom right, as a mutation, a few chose the careful viewers, the top image on the right, 
which has no sample woodblock print to start the drawing. The only different one in the 480 plus artworks. We checked to see how the non brody attendees from around the globe for the biannual Stanley Symposium viewed the mural. The results were very similar to the Stanley Center folks over the 10 days that they stayed there. The Broad Communications team also printed a poster of memories for Stanley Broad. At that reduced size, the text readability and image details became the expected main issue. We decided to also test them in two different environments to see how different audiences viewed them. We reconfigured the installations to fit the space and audience interests. At Lab Central, a biotech hub for startups with scientists and researchers from other fields, we used an installation re resembling migrating neurons using the narrative of neurogenesis. We checked regularly at different times over three months during different events. They saw the neuronal shapes, the garden, the patterns, the microscopic, the macroscopic, the scanning for selection, and the shared memories. No difference. But for the fine art college, Montserrat, we used retinal ganglion cells. As a visual artist, we used those in the eyes. A contemporary digital image from the show The Beautiful Mind at the MIT Museum, a traveling exhibit with its focus on drawings for Ramon E. Kayal and recent research drawings. We monitored over the summer. They saw the organic flow, the journey, the microscopic and the macroscopic. They focused on different entry and exit points, landscapes and seascapes. That was what was different. They were focusing on different entry and exit points. They were not revisiting the same ones. We forgot that the ocean was a few hundred feet away from the doorstep and hence the seascapes. All the work on this project resulted in an extended collaboration with Stanley Center. They commissioned a permanent installation. They chose the neurons, neurons they wanted for the installation to resemble, pyramidal and chandelier neurons. They shared images and information and participated from feedbacks on drafts to detailed discussions. I had daily meetings with around 30 of them during this course of the time. The excitatory pyramidal neuron was one of them. This was the final installation. And the inhibitory chandelier neuron, a subset of cortical GABA interneurons that they told me was very important in adolescents, how it developed affected mental disorder and other consequences that could develop. With around 650 images, including additional hand-drawn and digitally manipulated images, we installed them with help over three days along two long wall panels, a 10 foot by 56 foot corridor along the McCasco lab, a lab that focuses on nervous system biology through innovative genomics. We found that many viewers immediately changed the stand daily selection of 11 to 12 images, some even replacing one of the two key images with a new one. Some even remarked about how they found the new images more interesting. What we found interesting, this is how we see processes, synthesize, and share. This is how we continuously seek out the new to learn and evolve. With more than 550 hand-drawn artworks, it's a continuously growing collection. It can evolve on its own. What have we done here? We collected data, created and shared memories, through memories burned into wood blocks or matrices, with variations through multiple prints, tone samples, collaged artworks, cultured in different matrices, and looking for patterns, created more variations through different combinations in the mural, shared and tested in the lab and in other different environments. Our collaborative creative process is very similar to what happens at the Stanley Labs, all the way into therapeutics. Through this project, we have covered the three main Stanley groups and what Stanley was about. I was involved from the initial stages of planning. It was a meandering journey through space and time, from a 12th century Tamil poem, to digital decals, to Kayal and Franklin and Gauguin, to back and forth conversations informed by my studio, Stanley Center, Broad, Simmons, MassArt, Lab Central, and Montserrat, to a permanent commissioned installation, a journey we had never envisioned. Every project leads to even deeper questions. I was surrounded by all this complex and interconnected information pouring in from Broad. Todd Gollop, Bang Wong, Sarah Calwood, Dan Thompson, Catherine Luz, Eris Lieberman, Aiden, now Stanley Center, and other Brodies. 
I drew my inspiration from Dawn, who studied the simpler and smaller yeast, and Sarah, who talked to me about mitochondria and symbiosis, endosymbiosis. I made a personal connection. Were they talking about me? I, lit I literally looked back into translocations. I was surrounded by so much information pouring in from Broad. I explored in parallel what happens if we arrange them randomly or in a particular sequence and combine them as larger artworks. How do we synthesize the enormous complex information processed daily by scientists and researchers? This closely related series where object and process are intertwined became cultured interactions continuum. These are the large triptychs, 48 inches by 108 inches and 48 inches by 156 inches as they continue to layer the information and become more complex. Remove the final artwork from project one, following the invisible. It slowly evolved and transformed to become one of the final artworks for project two, cultured interactions, continuum induction. In 2018, I shared my ideas and concept to the broad through a conceptual drawing for cultured interactions as a site-specific mural for my 2018 to 19 exhibit, Cultured Interactions, Art, Science, and Broad. 16 artworks from a subseries, Cultured Interactions, Continuum, Spectrum, Sequence, and Consequence, was acquired by CMAP and PRISM, who are involved with information processing at Broad. My collaborative experiences reinforce my belief in Annie Albers' words. You can go from anywhere to anywhere. As we all know, Scientific research involves stepping into the unknown without fixed or definite answers. We've reached a point in research where we can choose what it means to be human, as I said before. The questions we ask, the interactions we have, the choices we make, and the pathways we choose answer the biological and social question. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? The abstract nature of these questions, the experimentation, and the continuous efforts involved in research mirrors the process of creating art and becomes a metaphor for the experience of life. By mapping cell structures and patterns, as they transform and evolve, we explore how changes at the microcosmic level lead us to visually and spiritually reflect on the macrocosm. My artworks have become more conceptual, space, time, and project specific. I've used different media, wood burning, drawing, from the hand-drawn to the digital, printmaking, painting, sculpture, video, and mural installation. I have learned as I have worked. More importantly, I'm seeing my art practice through new eyes. It has become about continuously learning from the people around me and evolving with them. The meandering journey has been intensely transformational. So what is the role of an artist in genomic and neurobiological research? How can an artist influence a project when brought into the initial or transitional stage? In both projects, I've had the opportunity to be involved from a key initial or transitional stage. My artistic tool set has been used to advance a research project with conversations between science, technology, engineering, art, and math, and to bridge the gap between the scientist and the layperson. And what is the role of an artist in all this? It is not necessarily only to provide solutions. It is not to be right or wrong. More importantly, it is to constantly raise questions, make suggestions, challenge, inspire, evoke, interpret, take creative leaps, fall flat without any fear of failure, inform and advance projects, to continuously move forward by contributing through the collaborative creative process. And how can we contribute? This seminar is one such exploration to share, reflect, and explore. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? I see us, artists, scientists, and engineers, all of us, in fact, no matter where we come from, coming together as human pathways, building an ever-growing complex web of memories that will inform future generations. These liminal meanderings could not have happened without the help and assistance of all these people who have collaborated with me from these institutions as well. Especially want to thank Fran, Anna, Lindsay, Michael Daniel, Michael Williams, the joint BME department, UNC Chapel Hill, NC State University, and all those who have made these two days a wonderful creative learning experience for me. Thank you all.
All I can say is, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. It's my pleasure. Um, it certainly gives us a lot to think about, especially the role of imagination in our future endeavors, um, as well as collaborations. Yes. So thank you. Um, we'll start with questions. Do we have any questions from the UNC side? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you just fine. All right. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. It was uh, eye-opening. My pleasure. Um, Thank you. Uh, I would have liked a less scripted presentation, but uh, I think you found a, a very uh, interesting balance between actually uh, accurately depicting uh, some uh, ideas and ha while not limiting the imagination and possibilities. Um, would you have an ad my question is, would you have an advice uh, to the scientific community on how to expand our thinking and just have new ideas and not be limited to our uh, specific focus. Yes, I always uh, talk about this in different ways because scientists and researchers are always asking me this question. From the first day I stepped into Broad, the question was, can you help us become a great scientist as opposed to a good scientist? And also the question is, how do we become creative? So these are like questions that I always wonder about and I always smile and laugh and I say, Everyone is creative. It's for us to find out what the creative impulse is in that person and to encourage them and mentor them so they can develop that instinct within them and make it into a technical speciality. Do you understand what I mean? But there are certain ways in which I always talk about it. The way I think that because working over the different projects, I realize is that one of the things that art brings into it is a sense of play, even before experimentation. It allows you to expand, not worry about the consequences. So you can laterally expand and ask many more questions than you do with a regular experimentation process. So the rigidity is not set. Also, we do not have the limitations that the scientists have where they have to set up a resolution or a solution to some problem. You know, we can present all the possibilities and say, which one do you want to go with? You know, that's one of the things that we can go with. So I always say this, focus on something that you're passionate about. Don't focus on the results. As I say, don't focus on failure. Don't focus on successes, just the journey and the people you are with, so that you build a good community and strong community that helps you evolve over a period of time. At least from my experience, that has been the case. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Welcome. <laughs> I learned early on not to be constrained by the laws of physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Any other questions over there at UNC? Yes, in the pink shirt. Right. Uh, hi, uh, I was wondering, um, for your representation of the DNA bases, where you chose the four uh, colors, uh, had you experimented with any other um, ways of differentiating the, uh, the pieces, such as shape or maybe other shapes of colors? Like, how did you arrive at that particular uh, set of four, or how to represent it? Well, because it's the CGAT sequence for visualization purposes, we were using Colors that people, primary colors, basically, that people can distinguish between each other in the first case. So we were uh, choosing the colors because red, blue, yellow is for painting and red, blue, green is for digital. Everybody can identify those forms. But within each of those red, because I'm a specialization and I teach color as well, I talk about hue and chroma and saturation and value. When the, when, when the values and all of them get too nuanced as a painterly, it is not difficult for the lay viewer to easily identify them or even for specialized viewers to differentiate between one and the other. So in visualization cases, we have to make sure that there's enough of a difference between them for you to be able to register it, but enough for them to know. So we play with values and chroma and saturation and all those things within that color field or within that color family, and then place them next to each other and see, because relative placing of color will also change the way you view color. So this is a problem that arises many times. I think Brewer is a person who specializes in it, who has done geological mapping and who works with color theory. So she set up a digital color field for that. And she, she's someone I've been following because I have, through my research, I've learned about her. But this was something that I developed on my own because we were experimenting with this process that maybe the position within the gene based on where it is and because of just like human beings function, if we are among friends, we function differently. If we are with our parents, we function differently. You know, it's, it's just that same thing. So where you lie, where in the structure, so structure, memory, function, position, all of them are somehow interrelated. And thus, complex, complex web is what we have to solve in order for us to understand more. Does it help? There was an, another question at UNC. Uh, yes, in the, the yellow shirt or sweater. <laughs> Thanks again for your very engaging talk. 
I thought Thank it was you. very inspiring. Just the sheer amount of complexity that you seem to juggle, um, just from drafting the art and lab to um, to then being there with the scientists and um, having these conversations. How do you structure your schedule to be able to manage all this? And then what is the distribution? <laughs> like, what's the distribution of work over the course of the project? Um, well, I try to keep my studio practice the main one because I, I schedule my meetings. I always have like I teach and schedule meetings. Try to because scientists and researchers are always having lab work and conferences and seminars and many many things. So it always is flexible. I have to have a flexible schedule for working. The other thing is that um, so I have two days for teaching and meetings usually. Then I have the rest of the time for my studio practice. Many times when I'm deeply obsessed with a project or focused and collaborating, all weekends are eaten up on the work. <laughs> you know, whenever I'm involved in a project, it's 24 hours on, just like genome sequencing. I'm working all the time. I'm on calls. There's always people calling at any point of time, texting me. The interesting thing that you will not realize is, is that human relationships develop over these projects. So many times people will call you conversationally over the weekend and say, Gupi, I thought of this. Or text a message and say, did you think of this? Or what can we do next? You know, these are the things. So we're not talking about it in a formal manner, in a restrained manner. That is only the starting position. After a point of time, it's, it's, we can be very rude during our heated discussions. <laughs> so that's how that's we do just it. just like our research. Yeah, that's button. how it should be, right? We can be open and share our thoughts and feelings all at the same time. Okay. Does it help? And any yes. other questions you. from UNC? Thank you. Any other questions over there? Did you have can a I question? Ask, in the... Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Oh. Whoever said that. Yeah, yeah, there's me, Shaw. Hi, Gopriya. Hi. Hi, Shaw. Uh, good talk. There is quite a bit of disorder in the gene organization. Your drawing seems to calm it down, uh, bring some sort of order. Have you ever thought of depicting or linking to the things that are within the new? I have not have thought of that. See, what has happened over the course of time is that I don't most of the times, because of the way my work has developed, it's usually questions raised by the people around me. That is how it has become. So initially, when I was an artist working on my own, I could focus on whatever I wanted and move to the projects that I wanted to do. Or a period of time, I've had to negotiate that with the needs of the art. What is critical, what is most important for them comes to the focus more, and I focus on that. But this is something to look into, uh, Shaw, and we are discussing about new projects that are actually happening in the Aiden lab, and we'll be having further discussions to see if I can have insights into them and to see about how that can address that problem, because disorder is one of them that we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Gopia. Hey, before I end, uh, amazing painting. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I think there was one more question from McNider. Was that Anna asking the question? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, you mentioned Ramon y Carjal several times, and we all know his uh, neuronal drawings. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there are other famous scientists that you know of that use drawings in the research. There are many currently who are doing, you know, art as a practice, and they're even showing, even at the Stanley Center, now they have the new corridor, new corridor where they're inviting art science people, collaborators. There are not so many influential people before, but I just got a few books from Roger Manley, where he's done, I think, museum uh, exhibits, and I was really thrilled and, like, fantastic. He's given me a collection to pour into over the weekend and beyond. For the next few months, I've been looking into him because as an art historian, as a researcher, and as a curator, he has given me a whole new field to look into. You know, though each time I meet somebody, they're wonderful enough to share with me their, you know, technical specialities, and so I can learn from them. Thank you, Anna. I but I'll look into that as well. I think there are quite a few in Europe as well. Yeah, because absolutely. Because I have been to conferences in Europe where they have art exhibits, original art They do, they do. There. there was one recently from Spain also. I think there was a call for it, but I was coming here. So I, couldn't yeah, have I, I can't remember the names, but I yeah. was very impressed with yeah. the, the artwork. One, the last one I saw had lights in it, and it was it actually had things in motion. Mm -hmm. Kinetics, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, NC State, your turn to ask some questions. Before we leave. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for that really interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, I really respect um, your dedication to taking 
uh, like an idealized form, we see a lot of approximation of it in biology. Mm -hmm. and adding that heterogeneity in is more realistic. And I also really respect the decision when we're making those really complex artworks to ground them back in the subject's uh, perspective by kind of requiring making those collages. And I had a question about your process for that because I noticed that they were, the collage pieces were various sizes and shapes, but mm -hmm. seemed to also be limited in sizes and shapes to those rectangular frame pieces. So can you explain sort of what uh, drove you to make those decisions and what decisions not to make or take more frame pieces? If you see some of my other, uh, the first project series, you would see actually two or three different types of prints being used. And so one would be actually a circle, very much like a Petri dish. That's sort of a highlighting, so I could use the rectilinear representations and the idealized forms. Then you would see the tone samples, which were also done from the freer prints that were done, which were just hand-drawn. So they were more like organic shape and randomly toned. The ones that I did in project two, what had happened was when I set it up, it's of the prints, the, the woodblock prints, as, you, as I showed you, the 16.125 inches by 5.5 inches each. So I had a long print, you know, because I was talking about a particular journey and I was thinking about that. And so when we came to the construction, when I realized that they were very complex, right, I actually tore them into six sections each. So I had 12 different prints. Just by tearing them slightly differently, I could manipulate them further. So to show them that even if I say in this fixed format, but if I do them just slightly differently and extend them because of the multiples and the nature of the prints itself by just turning, transforming them, right, just as we do mathematically, just visually turn them around, the whole image changes. You know, and what we see changes. So many times it's what we are looking for that we are seeing, not necessarily the things that are there that we are seeing. You know, it highlights that aspect as well. And, it's, and it also highlights so many combinations and permutations that are possible because if, if this is just me doing in 2D space and I'm with these limited shapes, can you imagine what we can do when the sizes are different and each of the samples are different sizes and we rotate them in 360 degrees or even more dim dimensions, you know, fifth dimension, fourth dimension and things like that. So we, in fact, the Aiden Lab, I think, is having discussions internally about what does dimension mean if we are able to alter these things. Does that make sense or what is the consequence of that? So many interesting things that I do not understand too much, but I try to understand from them and then put them through my process. Thank you. Other question? Yeah. Um, that kind of goes off what you were just mentioning. Um, my question is about how you manage communication to late ends. You mentioned that other people that may not be involved in the research may have trouble understanding how your art expresses the research. So how did you, more specifically in the one where you included text, how did you balance the text and your arts? Well, that's, that's where I was drawing inspiration from mark making. Hokusa is a great person who's, who, across cultures, everybody acknowledges is a great person who are drawing and communicating life. My focus is on life. As I always say, artists, engineers, scientists, all of us focus on life that in the sense that it is about us and our context to the universe and how we can contribute in whatever way or form that we do. So when he did that and he talks about it as a mark and a line, that's the basis for drawing. So it's a conceptual piece, so I'm abstracting the pieces, the neuronal shapes themselves, if you see across them. In some, you will think that they are families of figures or friends or colleagues collaborating with each other or spending time together. So it's a dance, so I'm drawing from Matisse, I'm drawing from Gauguin, I'm drawing from many, many artists who have gone before. I look back into art research, you know, I'm just openly looking into everything that I can get across to see how do I communicate in a very abstracted form so it still resembles the cellular. And you know, all the way into the microbiology and into the different stages. But at the same time, it gives you a vision that is much larger than yourself, not just human form, maybe even the universe sometimes. So it's always a struggle and it's always something that I'm exploring and experimenting with, learning on a daily basis. And luckily, over the years, I've slowly been transforming my artwork, I think. <laughs> so that's been the journey for me. Okay. I think then we'll um, let you go get some lunch. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Fran. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So those